and welcome to Dub Biology Apes Lessons to Go. In this video, we'll be exploring soil properties, texture, structure, and chemistry. Soil texture refers to the relative proportion of sand, silt, and clay particles in a sample of soil. If a soil sample has a higher composition of sand, it's going to have a gritty texture. Um, and in water, it's not going to hold together very well. Whereas with a higher uh, silt or clay, it's going to feel much smoother, uh, and in water, it's going to clump together really, really well. Now, there's uh, several different ways that a soil scientist can determine that soil texture and then classify it into its soil texture class. The first way would be a qualitative measurement. With practice, you can place a sample of moistened soil in your hand, and then using your thumb and forefinger to try to create a ribbon. The longer the ribbon, the more clay is going to be present because that soil sample is going to be able to hold together really well to form a nice thin ribbon. The more sand, it's going to fall apart much easier and won't form that ribbon. Now there's also a qualitative way that we can, uh, or sorry, quantitative way that we can figure out our soil texture class. And that is, you have a method for separating our particles um, into uh, layers. For example, using density and water uh, that will allow them to settle out so we can get our relative percentages. And then, we use those percentages along with a soil texture triangle. So, looks like in this sample we have a significant amounts of uh, gritty, sandy particles. And so let's say that our percent sand is relatively high. So we're going to say that's at least 50% sand. So on our uh, sand triangle, we're going in an upward diagonal. Okay, so that's going to uh, put us into this little quadrant here. Our next layer, we have probably about 25% of our uh, silt. So we find where 25 is, and with our soil triangle, we actually go in a downward uh, diagonal. So that puts us right here in this green area. So we have about 25% of our clay. So that way go horizontal. And so where the three lines overlap, that's going to be our soil texture class. So it's likely that this sample would be a sandy clay loam. Now the soil texture is going to actually affect its porosity and permeability. Remember, porosity refers to how much open space we have between the various soil particles. And then permeability is the degree of connectivity uh, between those soil pores. So, for example, gravel with its large particles is going to be very porous and very permeable. It's going to allow for most of the water to go through. Fine sand is kind of moderate. It's got a pretty good uh, porosity, but perhaps a little less permeability. And then clay is going, and solid rock is going to be our worst, the least porous and the least permeable. So fine textured soil um, is going to have a lot more pore space, and it's going to hold more water than, say, coarse uh, textured sandy soils. Coarse textured soils will have large, well-connected pore spaces and be much more permeable, so that's going to allow for that water to go through. Now, the next soil property that we'll explore is soil structure. The primary soil particles of sand, silt, and clay will be arranged into secondary units, which we call PEDs. The shape of these PEDs and the way they aggregate or come together is going to be referred to as the soil structure. The soil structure will affect how easily the air, the water, and the plant roots are going to move through that soil. There are four major classifications of soil structure. Granular, platy, blocky, and prismatic. Soil that has granular PEDs have the highest permeability and are excellent for plant growth. Clay and loamy soils often have blockier PEDs and they're going to have more moderate permeability. Well, soils with plate-shaped or platy PEDs um, that might al also resemble stack sheets of ice are too tightly packed and are very difficult for air and water to penetrate. Platy soils have typically a high clay content and are found in frequently flooded areas. These soils can oftentimes be called clay pan soils. Now, sand itself is a structuralist soil, and the primary particles won't actually aggregate together, but instead will fall apart. Now, the degree to which the soil 
and its uh, structure is going to resist pressure is referred to its consistence. These The terms sticky, loose, friable, soft, firm, very firm, and hard are used to describe the consistence of that soil. Good soil is friable, which means that it crumbles easily, so there's space for that air and water to move. Oftentimes, farm and construction machinery, machinery or even a herd of cattle, could put a great deal of pressure on the soil. So consistency is important when considering how land should be managed. So now we're going to move from physical properties of soil into chemical properties of soil. Now as plant material dies and decays, it's going to add organic matter in the form of humus to the soil. This is going to improve the soil's moisture retention and also affects the soil chemistry. Soil that's rich in this organics and rich in humus is going to have a lot easier time not only holding on to water but also to many plant nutrients. Cations such as calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium are uh, different uh, nutrients which are attracted and held very well with humus. These cations are weakly attracted to the humus and can be easily replaced by metallic ions like iron and aluminum, which then will release those cations so that the plants are actually able to use them. A soil's ability to exchange cations is called its CEC or cation exchange capacity. Soils that have the ability to absorb and retain exchangeable cations have this high cation exchange capacity. If you have a high cation exchange, uh, it's going to be considered a more fertile soil than those with low cation exchange. The soil particles will uh, hold on to the cations loosely. The roots will um, either release carbon dioxide as a byproduct of uh, cellular respiration, which then will interact with the water in the soil to produce uh, carbonate ions and release hydrogen ions into the soil. The hydrogen ions will take the place from the cations, allowing them to be absorbed into the root hairs. Additionally, uh, roots can also use active transport to pump those hydrogen ions directly into the soil so that they can release those cations so that they can be brought into the roots uh, for those nutrients that they need. Now a clay, or a clay soil, because of its alkalinity, is actually going to have a larger cation exchange than sandy soil. Now soil pH is another thing that's going to influence the availability of nutrients, which is going to then affect the kinds of plants that will grow, which then affects the amount of organic material that can be added into the soil. Remember, uh, on our pH scale, 7 is neutral. Anything less than 7 is considered acidic, and anything above uh, 7 is alkaline to 14. Now, the more acidic the soil, the more nutrients leach out of the soil, reducing their fertility, because acids oftentimes produce hydrogen ions themselves, which is going to disrupt um, the cations that are present in that soil. Excessively acidic soils could actually cause toxic levels of certain metals to leach out of the soil. Alkaline soils may contain appreciable amounts of sodium that might actually exceed the tolerance level of plants um, and contribute to a high bulk density or compactness um, and poor soil structure. Here's another example of how pH might impact um, soil and then the plants that grow in them. Hydrangeas in low pH soil actually uh, stay kind of a bluish purple where if you put them in a more basic or alkaline uh, condition, they actually will turn pink. The usefulness of soil comes from its structure and its chemistry. Understanding these major components will allow us to use the soil to its fullest extent and maintain its quality well into the future.